So good afternoon. Let's check the sound. So we'll start our session. I am Elizabeth Costa. I am from Portugal. I am the executive advisor of Bubayo Alliance. That is also a, a business association that aims to bring together different players uh, from the marine bioresources and the blue biotechnology value chain. Thank you for the invitation to be here, sharing this moment in this session with all of you, especially with our uh, dear invited speakers. And we will talk about this hot topic that is blue economy and algae production. In a world where sustainability and renewability and climate targets, carbonization, carbon neutrality, and climate ne uh, neutrality have become top priorities, ocean and waters can bring us natural-based solutions. And, in fact, marine bioresources and blue biotechnology innovations can ensure resource efficient processes and circular economic models to feed population, to avoid waste and to keep resources in use as long as possible. These issues will deliver impact in supporting a sustainable growth and development of European bio-based sectors, we hope that, creating jobs, innovation, and services. But for that, we need that governance, academy, industry, science, and even the citizens are, uh, must be aligned and uh, work together. And today, we will showcase different uh, cases and different issues that will cover all these topics. So without further ado, we will start this session uh, presenting uh, the sector of the blue economy that comprise the use and application of renewable aquatic biological resources as source processes, final products for food, health and well-being, pharma and bio-based solutions. Without further ado, I would like to call uh, our first uh, speaker. There is uh, Ms. Laura Okagova, Deputy Director at Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, responsible for implementing different European projects and that today will talk us about the Agenda 2030, more specifically about the Mission C-2030. The floor is yours. Enjoy our session, please. Thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Ochogova. I'm a Deputy Director of uh, Investment at uh, Governmental Agency, Investment and Development Agency of Latvia. Uh, and uh, and uh, today I invite you uh, to dive uh, with me into the Baltic Sea uh, and to see what's there, uh, the challenges and uh, the opportunities. For quite a long period of time, uh, we have been manufacturing and producing many products uh, without awareness of uh, what's left behind. And uh, the industrial revolutions one, two, three, and four uh, provided us an opportunity to produce even more and faster. Uh, but only within the fourth revolution did there appear the sustainability aspect or uh, what's left behind uh, and at some point uh, we understood that we are uh, losing our nature our waters and as an answer uh, to this there are different regulations uh, introduced to somehow get the whole picture together and to do something and to make an impact um, 
but uh, you know what happens when there are many regulations, many priorities. Uh, we strive to succeed in different many aspects, uh, but at the end making a little significant impact in uh, any. And our answer to this is uh, Mission C. We have put forward uh, our Baltic Sea uh, and we aim uh, to help our sea to become alive again uh, and to act as one uh, and to make an impact. Um, for now, uh, more than 97% uh, uh, of the Baltic Sea is uh, the so-called dead zone. So uh, only more than 2% of uh, our sea is uh, alive. Uh, so these uh, numbers are uh, really tragic. And that's why uh, we have uh, launched our mission C uh, in order to make our sea alive again. Um, and uh, we um, are uh, building a cooperation model uh, using the triple helix model when there are the government, uh, the research institutions and the industry working together uh, to make an impact. And um, we as a governmental uh, organization see uh, that our role is to introduce uh, new instruments, uh, tools and programs uh, to foster the, the necessary innovation uh, towards uh, blue economy uh, to help uh, our sea to, to become alive again, actually, uh, and to, to save it. Um, so, uh, regarding these uh, tools I mentioned, there are several very specific ones that we are uh, developing or have already launched. Uh, for example, uh, this year, uh, this spring, we launched our uh, mission accelerator, City to Sea. Uh, in the next slides, I will show you uh, what we have achieved uh, with this accelerator. The second tool is uh, probably the most ambitious one uh, from the governmental perspective. Uh, because uh, it's, it's a sandbox, uh, it's actually a law uh, that we are developing uh, currently uh, to enable uh, innovation processes, uh, to enable and to make uh, more easier uh, to create test beds, uh, to test these innovations uh, and new uh, approaches. Uh, and to make this sandbox actually is like a fast track for uh, innovations. Uh, but uh, of course it's uh, very challenging because we have to put in a law that we will make something like innovative but we don't know yet what it will be because it's innovation but you have to make it like fa in fast track uh, uh, mode uh, so it's uh, really challenging. Uh, but we have done a lot of work um, and so we hope that this, this year uh, this sandbox uh, law uh, will come into force. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, have done a lot of work regarding this. And we see uh, this uh, sandbox uh, will serve as a strong incentive for investors to attract more investment uh, for blue economy uh, initiatives in Latvia. So this is a very clear signal that uh, innovations uh, regarding uh, blue economy is uh, welcome in Latvia and uh, an innovator or startup uh, will uh, have a fast track to, uh, to bring them uh, to the uh, industry. The third one, uh, very important one, uh, is financing. Uh, where do we allocate our funds, our grants? Um, for now, we have launched uh, our Mission Science program, uh, grants for commercialization uh, projects. Uh, I will also explain uh, in the further slides uh, what we have uh, gained uh, up until now regarding this. But of course, regarding financing, uh, we see also to uh, European funds and uh, 
uh, and to Norway grants uh, as a great tool uh, to help and to foster and to boost uh, innovation processes in uh, Blue Partnership uh, projects. So this is a very important uh, tool uh, that could uh, accelerate the processes. And the last but not least is the navigation center. Uh, when you launch a mission, you have to have a navigation center when all these activities are brought together, overseen and, uh, and made uh, in the right uh, way and in the right pace and at the right moment. So you have to have a center where uh, all the things are being, uh, on the, all the programs and activities are being managed. Uh, so, when speaking about uh, the acceleration process, um, as I told, uh, we launched our accelerator, City to Sea, uh, and uh, the goal was to strengthen the impl implementation of the uh, Mission C. The program consists of three phases, the hackathon, uh, which has uh, just ended, the pre-incubation phase that has just started, and the incubation phase. Uh, this is only the first accelerator project. Uh, we uh, expect that more uh, such acceleration programs will come, um, hopefully uh, every year, uh, one such accelerator. Uh, this program focused on mobility, water innovations and supply change and was done in close cooperation with, uh, with universities and uh, innovation uh, districts and uh, movers in uh, Latvia like uh, VFresh. Uh, which uh, coordinates the uh, innovation district, uh, VEF. And also uh, our uh, free port of uh, Riga uh, was involved in this process. What are the results of this accelerator? Uh, here I have uh, put uh, some uh, interesting ideas that came out of the accelerator. But in total, there, were, uh, there was uh, approximately 150 uh, participants from 24 countries. So th this accelerator was Latvian initiative, but uh, it brought together uh, participants from 24 countries. It was not uh, only in, in, uh, in uh, Latvia or, or only, uh, only in Riga. Uh, so. Uh, there were uh, more than 20 teams, uh, 16 of them survived and uh, will go uh, into the next phase, pre-incubation. And uh, after the summer, uh, we are accepting 10 startups out of this program to uh, get into the incubation phase, where they will work on their prototypes and uh, go to market strategies. Uh, from these ideas, um, there were many from the submarines uh, to the wastewater treatment, uh, so many interesting ideas that uh, our participants worked on. Uh, the second uh, program uh, was Mission Science or Science for Water. We made an additional call to commercialization projects. Uh, One million euros was allocated uh, to this project. Um, ten projects uh, are under uh, evaluation, uh, five will get the money, so 200 uh, Ks uh, to each project approximately. Uh, and these are uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most uh, promising ones. Um, there are many more, ten in total. Um, by this uh, mission, we expect that uh, at the end of, uh, of the uh, uh, second year, uh, there will be uh, projects ready to market, either in the licensing process or spin-offs, because uh, applications uh, to these projects uh, were, um, were acceptable from the research institutions and universities. So uh, most of the universities applied, like uh, Riga Technical University, Maritime Academy, uh, also in cooperation with uh, Freeport of Riga and uh, others. So this is a very uh, interesting one. And in uh, one and a half years, uh, we'll see uh, what has been done there and how many spin-offs uh, are there to be created. Uh, and also our startups are... Um, 
working on uh, many uh, interesting ideas uh, regarding uh, blue economy. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, the latest ones. Um, one thing is also that water is not only liquid, but uh, water is, uh, is, consists also in, the, uh, in snow. So we not only um, uh, make uh, and build uh, snow parks for uh, the Olymp Olympic Games, we also know actually uh, how to predict uh, uh, what, uh, what the snow will do uh, and uh, how, to, uh, how to predict uh, where there will be uh, some, uh, some challenges uh, or, or some melting or, or something else. So the behavior of the snow is, uh, uh, is very important uh, in some areas. Also, the uh, technologies uh, to uh, improve the efi efficiency of uh, water flooding uh, or, um, or a system for utilization of sewage sludge uh, is uh, important and uh, our, our startups are uh, working on this. Um, I also can mention that uh, not only within startups but also within our uh, ports, uh, uh, we have several of them uh, in Latvia. They are also uh, working on uh, different uh, different solutions, uh, how to make uh, their, the port uh, everyday work more efficient and uh, within the sustainability principles. And uh, what is the moon for our mission and what we really aim to achieve is uh, we aim to develop a digital twin for uh, the Baltic Sea. Uh, to really help the sea we have to have a digital model uh, to see what's in there uh, and what has, uh, has have to be done uh, in order to make our uh, Baltic Sea alive again. Uh, we have already made a digital twin for uh, one river in Latvia to predict the flooding uh, very precisely. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the next big, big thing that has to be done. Of course, uh, we, are not only, we are not the only country uh, that um, borders with, uh, with the Baltic Sea. So it will take uh, many, part many countries as partners, NGOs, industry, science organizations uh, to make it really happen. But it is very important, as uh, today also was mentioned, the digital twin for the ocean. Uh, you have to see uh, the data that comes out of the waters to really understand uh, what it takes to, uh, to, to make an impact and to make changes. So uh, I hope that uh, we'll manage to, uh, to create uh, this unique twin uh, and to make uh, a world uh, a better place. So thank you. for presenting as, uh, your solutions to accelerate this innovation, uh, regenerating the, ba the Baltic Sea and, let's hope, other seas. And we will move now to our next speaker. Uh, uh, we, we change a little bit from the water application and we move to bioeconomy and pharmaceutics. For that, we, we, we invite uh, Maza Safunjik Kukuk, R&D Director of JGL from Croatia. Please join us. The floor is yours to present your solutions, your bio-based solutions for pharma. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I must say it's quite uh, motivating today to speak uh, at such an event. Uh, it's interesting how we, can, we are all from very different industries, but we all sh uh, share the same interest, and this is sustainable use of uh, seawater and oceans and blue economy. Uh, because as all seas and all oceans are connected, so are we. And uh, business of one influences the business uh, of another and that's why we really need to do it in sustainable matter. Uh, 
So uh, JGL is a Croatian pharmaceutical company. We exist from 1991, um, and we, uh, we operate on more than 60 markets through our own operations or to, through partners. And two of our biggest brands uh, are products that contain seawater. One, our biggest brand is Aquamaris. It's a line of medical devices containing seawater in different uh, pro proportions and uh, with the use of uh, maintaining hygiene of the nasal uh, cavity. And the second is a line of uh, medicinal products or medicines. That means that they have an active substance, in this case, the, the congestant. And, uh, but uh, this product also has seawater as a functional excipient in the product. Aquamag is, is on market for more than 20 years. And we are on more than 25 uh, markets uh, available. and. We are, I think, number one uh, of uh, nasal uh, saline solutions uh, producers. When we are talking uh, just briefly about pharmaceutical products, it's very important uh, which technology you have, and we have decided to uh, specialize in sterile solutions. That means that packaging that we use for our products is very, very important, and it influences the characteristics of your products and um, we decided that we want to do uh, products without preservatives and that's why uh, we need to have uh, that we need to have uh, preservative free packaging uh, solutions but today I'm here to talk uh, about to give you a brief overview of JGL's uh, expertise in using seawater as a resource as an uh, uh, ingredient in pharmaceutical uh, products and as you imagine the, the use of seawater is the pillar of uh, our business so uh, so we are very very interested in in uh, all uh, initiatives that aim to maintain seawater uh, as clean as possible and that all business is done in sustainable matter so um, as you may know, a pharma business is quite heavily regulated. There are many rules that you need to follow. Uh, GMP, good manufacturing practice, is one of them, or um, guidelines for quality of excipients, and those are all made to, uh, they're all here to protect the, the patient and the safety of the patient. But the base of it all is clean uh, sea and clean water. If the water is not clean, if the sea is polluted, then the, the ingredient won't be as clean and that's so uh, the, the medicine. So uh, we are, uh, it's important for us that uh, Europe and Croatia has policies and uh, directives for uh, to, to manage and protect our seas and that we uh, really enforce them, not just to have them on uh, paper. So uh, first thing uh, about using seawater as a resource is to set up your location. Uh, it was a lengthy process for us to select the location of uh, sourcing the seawater. Um, Luckily, we have a Center for Maritime Research, Institut Rujak Boskovic in Croatia, and we selected a location that's within the, uh, their area of constant monitoring. But it wasn't uh, that just enough. Uh, we had a quite um, extensive research of micro locations, seasonality, and depth uh, from where we uh, source the water. You need to go below the surface in order to avoid seasonality, uh, influence of uh, rainwater, and also, but not to go too deep because then you have uh, sediments uh, that you need to take uh, out. Uh, all of this product uh, process, as we are a pharma industry, needs to be validated, needs to be monitored. So. Each time that the boat goes uh, to source the water, the GPS location is monitored, the, the depth is uh, recorded, and uh, so on. 
And what are the characteristics of uh, this, uh, this uh, sourcing location? First, you need to be away from settlements. You need to be away from uh, any uh, type of industry in particular. It's better to be away from it. It's best if you don't have extensive fishing in the zone, at least if you need to have it, let it be seasonal. And also it's good to be away from uh, transport lines or, or extensive uh, maritime transport. At the moment, all of these uh, requirements are set, but the things are changing. Uh, there is a growth of population, there is a change in economy, there is tourism. And the Adriatic Sea is characteristic uh, because it, it's very, uh, <laughs> it's a small sea, very closed. So if anything happens, it will stay there for a long time. So we are cu now currently uh, looking to set up uh, some sort of control strategy and uh, initiatives what to do if uh, something happens. Because it would be easy if you can just take the salt and dissolve it in the water. You, uh, you get quite similar solution, but it's not the same in the characteristics that are important to us. So uh, I get a lot of, you just put seawater in the bottles and sell it. Haha, <laughs> it's so easy, but uh, tell me, let me tell you, it's not easy and it's not cheap. First, uh, okay, to harvest seawater and to bring it uh, offshore, it's not such a problem, but you need to store it and you need to maintain it uh, microbiologically acceptable during that storage. After that, there is a purification process, a set of uh, aseptic filters, because you need to uh, re get a um, sterile solution, because as, as I said, we have preservative-free products, so there is no preservatives that could kill some remaining uh, microorganisms. Uh, as soon as we do this uh, sterile filtration, the, the sea goes into a finished uh, product. So uh, it's quite a complex uh, and costly process to go from an ingredient that has a quite high bio burden to get a solution that has none uh, of microorganisms and to, to stay as that uh, for three years or how many uh, you, you want your product uh, to, to last. So one of the crucial parts is the quality control of that ingredient. In pharma, you need to have specification uh, for each uh, step and it's legally binding. So every batch of that seawater and uh, finished product needs to be within specification. If it's not, you can't put it uh, on the market. And the uh, parameters that we check uh, in seawater are physical and chemical parameters, content of ions, pesticide, organic compounds, hydrocyclic carbons, uh, and microbiological purity. And uh, when you dissolve sea uh, water in uh, uh, sea salt in regular water, not of all these uh, parameters uh, came out the same after this uh, dissolution. So that was uh, about, uh, briefly, about manufacturing. Actually, I will go briefly on all points today uh, because we don't have time to go into depth, but uh, I hope that I will give you just an overview of steps needed to, to come from an idea to the, uh, to the product. So uh, how do you get from the idea to the development? Uh, you, first, you need to be if you're in the pharma field, you need to have close collaboration with uh, medical professionals and patients. Why? Because you need to check your idea. If you think it's good, okay, but other people need to think also that it's a good idea. So uh, you need to have that close cooperation to see what the trends in therapies are. Uh, what are patients and uh, doctors uh, noticing about current uh, therapies? How do patients use the, those therapies? Are there any gaps? Because then is the second filter, then you need to think uh, which added value can I bring to the market? Uh, 
Is it that I need to simplify the use? Is it that I need to bring an innovative feature on the product or to lower uh, or to make a better safety profile? For example, we usually do this. We take out the preservatives from the product and make a preservative uh, free uh, product due to um, problems that are associated with uh, prolonged use of preservatives. And the third filter is a patent check, or even better if you can patent your idea, because you don't want to come to the market and see that somebody else ha has already patented uh, what you have uh, developed, or in better case, that you can patent something and uh, be the only player on the market. But these three filters and the, these three steps are not one-time job. You need to do it throughout the project because you don't want to go five years or six years into the project and come to the market and see that, some, that, that the situation has changed. So you quite often need to, to test your idea. So uh, let's say uh, that your idea is um, some new substance from a bioprospecting uh, process. What, just briefly, what, you, what do you need to do to come from the lab to the finished product? Uh, new molecules are very promising and very exciting, but please be aware that this is not a one, three-year uh, project. It will, it will be more three-year projects. It can be done in, in just three years, well, depending on the product category, but let's go on. Uh, you definitely need to do uh, your, pro your molecule characterization. What's its structure? What's your theoretical uh, mode uh, of action? Um, how easy will it be uh, to produce it? Uh, okay, one thing is lab scale, but later on in a scale up, uh, how easy and how costly will it be? Because if it's too expensive, it, it, the product will be too expensive uh, and it won't be uh, such a good idea anymore. Uh, and also, when you produce it, uh, which elements of quality will you uh, control? Also, the, the very important thing is the range of biological action. Is your product, uh, will, and that range of biological action uh, will determine your registration category. So. Uh, maybe it's a food, uh, a dietary supplement, and then you need to go to EFSA and have some uh, claims approved. Or a uh, medical device. Medical device is a product that helps alleviate the sims symptoms and prevent diseases, but it doesn't actively cure. Or the third most uh, complex category are medicines. It's uh, some ingredient that will actually cure some diseases. Different category, different amount of data, but in all of these cases, pro, uh, some clinical uh, study will be uh, needed. So prepare uh, for that. Just briefly, if you uh, decide for a medical device category, a uh, new medical device regulation has come into place in May 2021 that requires clinical data for I could say any, any new, really new project that you are putting on the market. Extensive technical uh, documentation needs to set up. You need to show that you have control over quality, that you control the risks, and that you manage changes in your developed product. And uh, at, the end, uh, at the end of the development, the start of the life cycle of the project, you need to get a certification if it's a medical device or marketing authorization application if it's an Eric's project. project. And uh, it's, if you want to change something, you need to go to the regulated process. And uh, that would be uh, all for me. It would be the, the, the last slide. Uh, I hope that I briefly introduce you how, how it's uh, to produce a pharmaceutical product. I know it's complex, but it's complex for a reason, and that's for, uh, for uh, patient uh, sa uh, safety. Because we as a pharma manufacturers are responsible for your health, but we all are responsible to have our seas clean, and with that we also uh, make safe uh, ourselves. Thank you.
Thank you, Maza. And just to let you know that you can continue this discussion uh, during the panel discussion for sure, because it is a, a challenging topic to bring uh, bio-based products, especially for the pharma market. Thank you so much. And now uh, let me introduce you our next, our next invited speaker that comes from Romania. Uh, Flaviana Rotaru, president of the Health and Bioeconomy Clusters, with a long career developing and implementing research projects. And then today we'll bring us an umbrella organization, the Ro Health Cluster, right? The floor is yours, please. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Probably the first question arriving in mind is, okay, why health clusters here? Actually, the name of Rohelt is Rohelt, the health and bioeconomy for health cluster, because we like to approach health from all points of view, because the concept of one health is um, dedicated also to what we breathe, what we eat, what we drink, and all of this make an one health approach of our health. Probably the pandemic already prove us that health is actually more important than any industry in the world, and hopefully will not disappear this excitement after the end of the pandemic, which is very close. Even so, uh, we had some touch with this uh, area before of bioeconomy, before pandemic. And what cluster are and can do for you, it's very important. So, what is actually a cluster? Because right now it's a little bit of confusion in the market. We have the clusters from the Horizon Europe financing. We have the cluster as cluster as they have been invented. Oh, here it is. I hope I'm gonna handle this. And it's very important, okay, that to know that everything is so new but so old again. Because as you can see, Michael Porter took care also of, of this. In a very simple way of defining, clusters are like gangs, but it's very important to know that in a real clusters, in these groups with the same objectives and mainly focused on commercial relations and R&D and innovation, it's very important the number of SMEs. These clusters are several types. You have regional, national, you have uh, meta cluster, you have European meta cluster. They are usually thematics. That means that you have a cluster of health, you can have a cluster of energy, and this is how they are all around the Europe. They can be regional, they can be national, they can be European meta cluster, and so on. These entities exist for at least seven to 10 years from 2010. They are financed separately by the EU Commission, and they are actually the closest way to get in touch in a region with the entities interested in research and innovation from that area. So if you want to have research projects and you are in a very hard, in a big hurry, go to clusters. Stop Googling for information why. This is their purpose, to help their members to go in project, to develop their product. And more than this, they will exactly tell you what in, on the market on the, and also on the value chain. So despite statistics, which are usually two years old, you have very concrete on-site information. For this, you have to use, it's a, there is an European cluster collaboration platform. There you can find all the clusters in Europe and not only. You can also read about their willingness to develop, they can read about their members, and of course you can always contact their cluster coordinator. I make a search for you. Right now, if you go after Blue Growth, you have 402 clusters working on this domain. If you want blue economy, and so the big numbers are Europe, the small numbers are for Romania. But I want to see how easy it is to just find out. If you look after ocean, we have only 16, C60, 7 for river. The, the, the difference is that 
they are entities, these are entities focused on business. If we discuss uh, fi uh, Norway uh, f uh, financing, it's more dedicated to business than to public research, so it will help you to find them easier. If we want to compare, this is an event organized by Norway, so these clusters have also quality levels. You hear this cluster, it's a gold, it's a silver, it's a bronze. Well, there is a secretariat of uh, European Commission who evaluates the work. This means how active a cluster is, how much, how much do you manage to satisfy your members in projects, in collaboration, and so on. And you can get different levels. These levels are really very hard to get. So you can have also a filter to see, OK, if it's starting from, it has a label, a European label, it might be easier to work with them, but it's not mandatory to have a label and to be a cluster. However, if we look at the blue economy, bioeconomy, Norway has two out of the three gold cluster in Europe. There is nothing more than gold as uh, the level of cooperation. So I'm sure if you are a Romanian or another country that wants a Norway partner, you can go directly to these clusters and the time will be shorter. For health in Romania, we are the only gold cluster in Europe. There are nine gold clusters for health. And uh, as you can see, Denmark, Germany, Norway, and Romania are the only one having gold clusters for health. That means that this cluster already managed to do more than the, let's say, the starting cluster. Everyone can get this certification, but based on proven work and quality of their work. If you look in Romania, it's such a large and wonderful country, and I'm very proud to be part of it. And as our uh, head of director has said, it's not only about sea or rivers, it's about every piece of water. We have a lot of clusters. I put only the ones who had bioeconomy as the field. And of course, Rohelt, which is a, a national cluster. But in fact, we have blue growth, this cluster, bioeconomy, this cluster, I won't read them. And, and for environmental industries, this cluster. Why? This blue economy and blue growth um, concept started publicly very recent. So not everyone man, uh, changed the direction only to blue, because we still have to keep also the green. So, for example, you have Biodanubius. This is a cluster which is in the area of the sea coast, but it's a, also another Biodanubius dedicated only to, to ocean. The information is public in the database, I told you, so all you have to do is Google search. It's very easy. Why I, didn't, I wanted to put this definition? Because each time I say bioeconomy, everybody comes with a different idea and definition. And this was, for example, if you want to write it, you find bioeconomy with Y, without Y, with B capital, B small, and so on. This is the definition from European Commission website, and they think that it covers everything, and it's very good to read every word because it actually gives you an idea how wide this domain it is. I want to be proud again because one of the first persons in the world who spoke about bioeconomy, it's a Romanian. His name is Grigore Antipa, who published an article in 1931 about biosociology and bioeconomy of the Black Sea. I cannot say the work of this wonderful, amazing person, even invented the dioramas. You know, in the museums, you have this uh, glass uh, where you can see stuff. But this guy was actually a genius who told about how important it is to take up, uh, care about our environment and all of this before the European Commission existed. So I have to mention it, and you can imagine the legacy we have and how much burden it comes on our shoulders. Again, uh, the mention that our colleagues already said included those outmost regions and landlocked countries. Why I'm presenting this? Because as a study case, you will have some companies which are not located on the sea coast. However, they work a lot with the sea coast. 
Uh, we are for health, we are dealing with novel foods, pharmaceuticals, com cosmetics. I want to stress what my, the previous speaker said. For, uh, let's say, from an idea of a pill to go to the market, it's usually between 9 and 12 years, really, from the first formula. If we talk about the medical equipment, the average is six years to go to the market from the idea. So here, the research and innovation takes time, but it comes also because of the responsibility we have, first not to kill you and then to treat you. So it's very important to do all these steps in the proper way, because medical device, as definition, is also the drop you put in your eyes in order to get the eye wet. It's a medical device. So it should be tested and certified. Raw health is health and bioeconomy, but I want to show our structure. As you can see, we have a lot of SMEs. We have hospitals, universities, research institutes, NGOs, because everything related to health is connected with patient empowerment. Today, if you go for EU funding, if you don't have a patient uh, association in the project and you refer to health, you don't get finance anywhere. So be very careful if you look uh, work on these uh, biomaterials or you need these patient guys, patient representative. Since we are a large cluster, we have groups. And we have bioeconomy for health as group, but also e-health because they we develop a lot of uh, data and materials for health. These are groups that continuously produce in relations with the, uh, also with the bioeconomy. How the cluster can help you? They will help you with the identification of development direction. They will help you with needs prioritization. They will help you with funding sources, regardless, non-reimbursable, bank, uh, private investors. Cluster do this on a daily basis, the cluster that really do their job, because it's, it's very important to look where to go. And also, they can validate your results, because the cluster is like a family. When you have an idea, and you are not sure if to go to the market, it's easier to discuss with some fellow from the clusters. And if it's not the case, not to put resources in, a, in the idea sorted to, to that. So it's very important to communicate with your fellow colleagues. Also, it helps you with planning, because if you don't know this pharma area, you don't know this 12, nine years to 12 years, so then you have, maybe you have false expectations. Also, you can, you can use the infrastructure or other members in the cluster because you have universities, you have public research institutes that are very eager to have SMEs working on their um, infrastructures. Also, we look on the economic, uh, social economic impact. We exchange human resources. In our cluster, we have projects. We are actually have experts from different type of entities. Even if it's a company, as leader, you have members, you have uh, members of the team from university, from other private companies, because we have like commercial contracts saying, I can use your bioinformatician for six months, and then he's going back to you full time. This is the level of cooperation the cluster can, uh, can achieve. And also, we can intermediate, we can negotiate as cluster for you. For example, we negotiate for a group, for all our members, we negotiate the courses. For people who are not working in the area, they don't know how expenses are, for example, the clinical studies courses. And we negotiate with the providers and we get better prices. We say if they are of health, they are like a group, you take them like they are from one entity even if you take them there separately. So you can do that because you represent a larger group. Legal analysis, you always know the regulations, so this is what cluster do. They are keeping you informed in a very targeted and specific way with the information related to your domain. So it's easier instead of searching millions of websites. And if you want to know something, it's enough to ask a question by email, and for sure somebody will be able to answer because it has the hands-on experience. 
What we also do, we do uh, cluster uh, idea analysis and always give a second opinion on risk. And at the end of the project, but not only, we promote the results and we help them to go to the next uh, step. Why cluster and why not? If you don't like to collaborate, don't go to clusters because they are born on this concept on a simple math. 30% of something is more than 100% of nothing. So a simple math will show you how cluster work because instead of competing each other, if we work together, everybody will have benefits and will manage to go further. What we also can do, a cluster do, they can help you to raise awareness, to facilitate access to different things, but also to work on policy. Much more on figures, our cluster has projects, our members, for more than 240 million euro, close to the budget of uh, Norway grants, so we, and we are still building on it. Okay, but besides the number of the EU grants, you can know from our reports that half of this amount is on commercial services they do to each other. So actually it's like everyone is doing, I don't know what kind of certification with two or three companies from the cluster because you trust them. Because you know that these guys will do the best in order to be recommended further. Also what we do, for example, you see in the left corner Medro. Medro is a network of health clusters in Romania. And we use them in, a very, in a one minute to push on policy. And I will jump to this slide and this is the last one. This is a company that is actually a company of a surgeon. It's a lady doctor who every day operates ophthalmology ocular cancer. Ocular cancer has no treatment, it's just surgical and then you put a fake eye in the person's area. From this everyday work, and she was related to children, the idea of a special material who will look much more natural and will be much friendly with the friction on the eye space, it came this, and the material used is from the sea snails from the Black Sea. So it's a biomaterial with direct use. Where is the project now? It already was financed through SOP, I'm sorry, but we are looking for scale-up funding. Already had tests on uh, rabbits and mouses, so we are looking for a human clinical study. So this is one of the many projects we can think about for health of the sailors and so on. I will send the presentation, already have on the email, so I will stop here, not before inviting you to the Be Health event, which is an international event, um, which has a special panel for bioeconomy for health, where you can learn much more about our uh, members' research in health. This is all for me now. I hope I didn't went too much and too far with the timing. Thank you very much. Uh, time to add some notes during the discussion. You will be the, the first one discussion during the panel. Uh, and thank you so much for presenting this landscape of the clusters. And now we, we move to our next speaker. There is Magdalene Krokida, professor and chemical engineer, engineering here from, from Greece. You are here with us, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> nice to meet you. So, and now we move to the another challenge. There is two, how to feed the population. And you, I think you bring some solutions using waste for the food segment in blue economy. So the floor is yours, welcome. Um, thank you, good afternoon. Actually, there is a small change in the schedule because uh, Professor Krokida could not make it today. Um, I am Theofania Tironi, Assistant Professor at the Agriculture University of Athens, and I'm representing today on behalf of the, of the National Technical University of Athens, the project SUMAFOOD. 
The Suma Food Project is a, actually Suma Food is a transnational partnership between three industrial partners, three universities, and one R&D research institute from Greece, Norway, Romania, and Spain. Suma Food is coordinated by Sintef Energy Research in Norway. This project intends to reduce food waste and increase the productive use of marine biomass by developing innovative processing and preservation methods and ingredients that will serve as a, a basis for the development of new food products. The basis of the project is the fact that globally about one third of the food produced for human consumption are annually discarded. This project addresses innovative utilization of uh, marine biomass and bioproducts and will demonstrate how such resources can be made available and at the same time attractive to the consumers, thus adding value to the biomass value chain. The main objective of the Suma Food Project is to develop and demonstrate eco-innovative preservation solutions for marine biomasses. The target products are marine biomass powders, which can be used as food, as ingredients, or as uh, feed material. The Suma Food uh, focuses on different technological areas within the, aqua food, the aquatic food chain. Uh, these are uh, the pre-processing and enhanced utilization of fresh raw materials, the alternative drying technologies with the aim to reduce energy consumption, the quality assessment and the increased market approval of the final products, and post-processing, including uh, encapsulation, formulation, and packaging of the products for the improved uh, product preservation and stability. Overall, two demo cases will be established within this project, one for a salmon slaughter plant and another for seaweed, with the aim to demonstrate the waste reduction, to enhance the product quality and stability, and to provide unique products in a, grow in a growing marine value chain. Four associated partners will contribute with biomass, uh, with providing biomass to the project and by their involvement in an external industry advisory board. Up to now and within this project, new functional products have been designed by the direct integration of these marine biomass powders into uh, the recipe of bakery products such as brioche and snacks. Sensorial analysis are performed to reveal how the consumers perceive the appearance, the aroma, the taste or the texture of these novel food products. And systematic storage tests evaluate their stability and self-life in the actual food supply chain. Overall, by the demonstration of uh, enhanced utilization of the marine biomass, the Suma Food Project aims to contribute to valuable growth and increase sustainability of European blue bioeconomy uh, in the actual food uh, value chains. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. We will keep the conversation about the waste and the valorization of waste for food uh, during our uh, panel discussion. And now uh, it's so glad, I'm, I'm so glad to be with you all uh, in a face-to-face -face event, but I think we must uh, come back to the online events since our next speaker, Christian Eriksson, CEO from NCA Aquatech Cluster is in Norway and he will join us now to talk about Aquatech in Norway, another cluster, and talk about the activity of the cluster. Yes. Hi, Can Christian. you hear me now? 
Yes, we are hearing. Yes. Good afternoon Good. and welcome. Yes. Thanks for that and, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, we would have loved to be uh, in Athens today, uh, but sadly we had an uh, external event preventing us to joining. Um, but I'm glad that we had the opportunity to do this uh, live. Yes. Okay, you can start, you can share your pre presentation. I yeah, think. Um, just give me two seconds. I'll, I'll um, share my screen. So I can introduce, I talk about the NCA cl Aquatec cluster that is one of the biggest cluster in Norway. Okay, you are sharing now. Yes, you can see it now. Yeah. Yes, the e floor, um, the e floor is yours. You can start, please. Thank you. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, we're one of the biggest aquaculture uh, clusters in Norway and we're one of the biggest aquaculture technology clusters in the world. And we were asked if we could join and speak uh, how we see blue growth as an opportunity. So, so first of all, uh, just a short slide to show who we are. Uh, we're approximately a hundred companies, all related to or within aquaculture um both salmon producers and technology suppliers uh, all the way to, to financial institutions and of course r d and our goal and, and the reason why we're here speaking today is to enhance the level of collaboration uh, not only collaboration in norway but for us also collaboration from norway and abroad um, so hopefully some of you attending today will reach out afterwards. Um, our main goal is to increase uh, the production uh, in the ocean. Uh, and by now we're focusing on salmon, but it's not only salmon for us, uh, it's all food production. So, and uh, to take us back to uh, the title and, and what we were asked to, to talk about, blue growth. Um, you might know this uh, job done by OECD some years ago that showed that uh, they expected an annual growth of three and a half percent or more annually uh, in the ocean economy up until 2030. And with the situation we see worldwide now with the declining economy, uh, it's even more important to look what opportunities that the blue growth gives us. Now, as you can see in red, um, you can see here that three of the industries that are expected to have the highest potential for growth in the years to come are within fish, fish processing and aquaculture. And of course, offshore wind is the highest, and, and that's because the huge uh, demand for energy and renewable energy we have worldwide, but also due to the small amount of offshore wind that we see globally. But why is it this way? Why is it blue growth? And why is it for us, uh, aquaculture and aquaculture technology uh, is such a huge opportunity? And why are we looking for collaboration all around the world? Um, it's because we have this huge, uh, as I say here, force, but it's a huge uh, uh, opportunity that we have to, to grab. And it's also a huge demand for us. And, and that's the demand uh, both today and in the future for food. And many uh, people before me has said that, why do we call this planet Earth uh, when it consists of 70% ocean? But that's also a big issue when it comes to food production, because as you can see uh, on the estimated supply uh, and human consumption on the left in my slide, um, total calories uh, that we eat, 98% uh, of them uh, comes from uh, land mass and land-based production. And only 2% of our calories comes from the ocean. 
when we know that an estimated world supply uh, comes 50, 50, approximately 50-50, there's a, a huge potential to do increased food supply from the oceans. When we also have new megatrends uh, that uh, makes us, we're gonna be more people on planet Earth, uh, we're gro growing even older. When we look to the development, developed countries, health and well-being is a huge driving trend, but also the focus on more sustainable food, source, food sources. And one of these food sources are uh, marine food, fish, plant-based algae, but for us, uh, farmed fish. And it's a huge potential because when we see on our live fish stocks globally, uh, they're overexploited. And we have good examples, some of them in Norway, some of them abroad, where we, we sustainably harvest on fish stocks. But to meet the future demand, we need to start growing the sea. When we also have the big challenge of uh, drought and the lack of suitable areas to grow food for the human population, we need to look to the ocean. And as you and I stated, and it stands in the title of this slide, uh, it's expected that the global food demand will increase with 69% towards 2050. Where are we going to grow this food? In Norway, there was done a job um, actually 10 years ago today that looked at um, the marine area and blue growth on different part of the blue industry had a huge potential to increase the value generation in Norway. Uh, it wouldn't be easy, but with the correct development and the correct collaboration, there would be a potential for growth. And within aquaculture supplier industry as well, there was a huge potential to increase value creation in Norway. This is the same that we are now seeing abroad. Uh, we are collaborating uh, with countries in Asia and over uh, in Americas, uh, where both local suppliers and Norwegian suppliers are collaborating to develop technologies that enable us to uh, grow the ocean. But it's hugely important to remember that uh, aquaculture is way more than salmon. And um, if we see now globally, it's depending on which statistics you're looking at, but Norway is now approximately the 10th or 11th largest aquaculture producer in the world. Uh, our production is mainly salmon. And what's uh, important and what's an interesting opportunity for collaboration is that you can compare the salmon with uh, the Tesla of the car industry. Because as movie, as one of the biggest salmon, um, salmon producers has stated, uh, it's the species that we do farming on with the high le highest level of industrialization today. And it's also the species that pushes technology development further. But it's not in that way that this technology is only suitable for Atlantic salmon. We can uh, derive technologies from Atlantic salmon production to other species. This is a great opportunity for collaboration. So why look to Norway? Uh, because we're a global hub. In Norway, in the last 10 years, we have had a stagnation in growth. We haven't been able to increase the salmon production as, mal as much as the demand in the market. And therefore, the government has issued a new type of licenses that enables us to produce in new areas that can either be uh, closed containment systems at sea it could be offshore farming licenses, as you see some of examples here in the slide, but also land-based production systems. And of course, these are going to help the Norwegian salmon farmers to grow. But this is also a fantastic technology 
that allows us to grow and produce food in more harsh environments. Because even though that the net pen that we use today in, in production uh, for both sea bass and bream and salmon and tilapia, it's a fantastic technology. Uh, it has issues when it comes to wave heights and exposed areas. Um, here, Norway is one of the front runners in the world, and this is gonna allow us to grow uh, worldwide. So when you look at it globally, in this slide, um, the dark blue dots are typical salmon producing areas with sheltered waters, with fjords, islands, and the correct water temperature. Uh, the lighter blue ones are areas. For instance, Mediterranean, uh, where we see a growth in focus on food production, uh, both from algae, but also from uh, fish species like bass and bream, more developing. How can we together uh, collaborate so we can utilize more of these areas and potentially maybe how can we collaborate so that we can in the future produce food also in the fully exposed areas in the mid-atlantic or even though in the mid-pacific we might, might look at this today as a dream and a dream that's hard to to actually make into a reality uh, but with collaboration, we think that we think that we can take steps towards this. And from us, if you look on uh, the Mediterranean, it has a much wider experience on farming marine fishes. Um, and for us in Norway now, trying to, to grow up an industry with marine species, it's a uh, high demand for, for collaboration on, on the knowledge on, on how to grow uh, more marine species. But from us, it, it's also important to state that the future, uh, it's not just one technology and it's not just uh, offshore farming of salmon or uh, net pen farming of bass and bream in the Mediterranean. We're going to see, since we have this huge demand for food in the future, but we also have a lack of suitable areas uh, to do today's aquaculture production, we're going to see a diversification. Uh, some of these diversifications we have seen today, um, stated in on the right-hand side of my slide now, with Salmar Acker Oceans uh, offshore farm, with Nufitex close uh, land-based systems, with Helge Aquas closed containment systems for sea, uh, with uh, Mosseval's semi-closed system, and of course, uh, submersible systems that we see coming up now, uh, with this one in the uh, far right uh, side, uh, with Aqua Group's Atlantis. All of these are going to let us it grow more of the ocean in the future, but we have still more to come and still new technologies that are going to be developed and meet the demands for uh, different areas around the world and of course, different species. What we can offer, uh, we can offer a ecosystem for collaboration, both with companies, world leading R&D institutions, universities, and a government that allows for growth and innovation. And hopefully some of you uh, would contact me uh, afterwards. Uh, please feel free to, to either give me a call, send me an email, uh, and we can see if there's uh, areas of interest both in Norway and in Greece to increase collaboration um, all with a goal to increase the world's food supply. And for us, uh, the food supply that comes from the ocean. Thank you so much, Christian. I think we will have the opportunity uh, to, to talk about the aquaculture in Norway later on after the, the coffee break. We have also here other representatives from Norway. Uh, 
Thank you so much for this wrap-up about the cooperation on the development of technology and solutions enabling sustainable growth in aquaculture based for food production. And uh, today we have other presentations about clusters and who knows that from this event an European cluster joining forces could arrive. Okay, so thank you so much and thank you for, for joining us. And now we have to continue for our, our last presentation of this first part. And I invite Jan Eric Giesen for a business case from clusters and from a corporate. We have now a business case, Algalif, that will introduce you the algae topic of this session. The floor is yours. Uh, just to, to introduce Jan, is the head of R&D uh, at Algalif. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I am Jan Erik. I am head of R&D at, at uh, Alkalif in Iceland, and I'm going to use this, uh, use my time here to just briefly present to you what what we are doing. So, uh, uh, Alkalif is a company that is formed in Norway in 2012. So we have a good relation to to this uh, to this conference in that term. But the company relocated to Iceland in 2013 and has been operating there ever since. We are cultivating the microalgae Haematococcus pluvialis and use it to produce the uh, chemical compound astaxanthin. This production started in 2014. We have now uh, around 50 employees, but we are currently expanding our uh, facilities and we will be uh, we will have l around 80 employees in, in in around one year so what is astaxanthin i'm just going to go very briefly through this since since the time is limited it's a keto carotenoid compound and uh, it's uh, the the uh, nature's most potent um, antioxidant so you will know this compound from the uh, from the uh, red or, or pink or orange color that you see in salmon, for example, uh, shrimp and lobster. So the, the reason for this, this color is this chemical compound, astaxanthin. Um, so as I said, the nature's most potent antioxidant, uh, the antioxidant properties of this compound is around five times stronger than for uh, beta-carotene and around 6,000 times stronger than for vitamin C. So what this compound does is the, it protects the cells and tissues from free radicals and other reactive chemicals that can have harmful uh, effects. So the microalgae that we cultivate use this compound to protect against unfavorable conditions in nature, for example, lack of nutrients, high light intensity, high temperatures, high salinity, and so on. And uh, this compound helps the microalgae survive these bad conditions and wait until the conditions come better and then, then it can start grow and reproduce again. Um, so we produce this as a food supplement, but it can also be used for cosmetics, for medicine and for animal feed. Uh, as a food supplement, uh, astaxanthin has a very broad variety of beneficial effects for the human body and I'm not going to go through this uh, in any detail, but just briefly, it protects the skin against uh, ultraviolet radiation, maintains uh, mo moisture in the skin, increases muscle endurance, reduces lactic acid produc production, reduces inflammation in the body, and is therefore good for your joints, for example. Uh, for more information on the, on the compound, I just urge you to, to ba basically Google it. Um, so here is what we do. We start with the algae just basically on, uh, on an agar slant and then later plate. And we introduce that to, liquid, uh, to a liquid culture, basically in Erlenmeyer flasks, very small flasks. And we let the algae just uh, grow and reproduce and, and form a dense culture before scaling this up to the next and the next and the next level. And then at a certain point, we stop providing the best cultivation um, 
conditions for the algae because our goal is not to produce as much algae as possible. We want to produce this chemical compound, astaxanthin. So what we do is we provide some, some stress to the cells, cells uh, in the starvation and then red phase with several different um, stress factors, including like uh, uh, nutrient depletion, including increasing the intensity of the light and, and reducing the wavelength of the light and adding salt to the culture. This is a freshwater algae, so it doesn't like salt. And we do all this to get the algae to produce as much astaxanthin as possible. Uh, we customized our own um, LED lights for this because the algae is, of course, photosynthetic and needs artificial, uh, we use artificial illumination to, get, to let the algae grow. Uh, first, we started off the company with, with just very basic, broad uh, HPS lights, which are used uh, widely in, in greenhouses, and replaced that with our own customized uh, LED lights with different wavelengths in different part of the, um, different part of the cultivation process uh, in order to, to achieve the goals that we want on, on each stage of the, of the cultivation. So here are a few photos. I mean, it's, it's relatively difficult to, to, to just tell us about what we're doing. So I have a few photos to show you how, the, how this uh, looks, how the facility looks like. So these are our green phase reactors, tubular photobioreactors uh, filled with, with algae. So I'm just going to run a few, few uh, pictures to show you how this looks. And as you see, we have these, uh, these LED lights to, to, to make the algae grow. This, this is how the algae looks in the pipes at the green stage when the algae is uh, at maximum growth. And then here we have started uh, the starvation phase where we basically start making the algae um, produce astaxanthin. And then the culture turns from green to brown. And then in the end, uh, we, we emit simply uh, all the, or, or we, we let all the uh, stress factors that, that are basically known, uh, put them in all in at the same time, uh, including the blue lights, and that makes the algae turn completely red. And the red color is just basically because of this, this compound that we are producing. Our downstream process, uh, this is the belt dryer where we dry and harvest our, our, our culture. And here you can see the product. Uh, this is biomass with around five, five and a half percent of astaxanthin. Then the last step of our, our process is basically to perform critical CO2 extraction to, to extract the astaxanthin from the biomass. And then we have our, our final product uh, dissolved in, in oil. Um, so the astaxanthin market, few, few words on that. So the majority of the astaxanthin produced today is made by chemical methods, uh, mainly as a colorant in salmon farming. But the demand for natural astaxanthin as we are producing is always increasing uh, and is around 25 tons per year now. And I also want you to understand that, that this compound is extremely valuable. Uh, each kilogram of, of purified uh, astaxanthin has the worth of between seven and nine thousand US dollars. So, uh, so that's uh, yeah, th it's a very valuable uh, compound. I also wanted to discuss very briefly why we are doing this in Iceland because uh, Iceland has the disadvantage for for this industry of uh, having probably along with Norway the highest salary costs in the world. And uh, the reasons why, why Iceland makes sense as a location for this is basically that we have, uh, we have abundance of, of clean, uh, clean water that we need for this process. And uh, also we have access to clean and renewable energy at a very, very low prices because we need a lot of energy to, to enlight our, our, um, uh, our lights. We have also stable weather conditions all year round, and this is maybe the only time that I will ever say that, that the weather in Iceland is basically very good, because uh, I must say in general I like the weather in Greece much more. Um, so we have to focus on producing uh, very high valuable compounds uh, using our uh, advantages of clean water, of clean and renewable energy, 
to to uh, to operate um, a biotechnology company like this in Iceland. So in a very short time, we have become a leading company in the global production of, of natural astaxanthin, uh, and the company is is in many terms ahead of, of competitors in various fields of, of the uh, production. I'm not going to go through uh, through that all because, uh, like I say, the, the, the time is limited. Uh, today, we produce around one and a half ton of pure astaxanthin per year. Uh, one year ago, we broke ground for, for an expansion, as I mentioned. Um, so two new buildings are being constructed at our site at Reykjanesbær in, in uh, close to the National Airport in Keflavik, and uh, it's around 30 million US dollar foreign investment. Uh, and as I said, we will be around 80 people with with full time jobs after this is finished. So demand for natural astaxanthin has grown continuously in recent years, and most indicators suggest that this growth will continue in the coming years. Thank you very much. Eric, for introducing us to this process of uh, extracting astaxanthin, since you extract the astaxanthin from the microalgae, right? Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, we will have not now time for questions, but after the discussion, so save your questions and you can ask them later on. And now we will have uh, a break of 20 minutes, please. Uh, be here with us at 10 to 4, to 4 o'clock and uh, have a nice break. Thank you. The last two years were very intensive in development of activities towards the startups, towards the uh, blue economy and uh, similar acti actions. To clean the flat we have created also our child. It's uh, our clean hub, it's uh, our training center that is focuses on the knowledge gained over the, all of our activities. And for me, it's very important also here to say loud that we are very open for the sharing the knowledge that you already gained and you would like to share out. Because uh, when we start some new projects, I saw that we lack of uh, knowledge and also today I will touch the activity of Green Offshore Tech that is, uh, clearly shows that we have no clue about the offshore operations, but in the same time, we have a great potential for that. So we with pleasure would take the knowledge that you already gained on that and would bring to the, our country, to our entrepreneurs to develop those activities further. I'm a little bit want to touch also the research project that still is in the development phases, but the project that is uh, very significant to, to demonstrate that we are not only entrepreneurs who are just selling and buying, but also the entrepreneurs who is looking for the new technologies, new approaches, who is trying to find their ways to use the uh, resources in the right ways. Uh, the one of the most challenging issues, I think that it's a meta-on in our world, so our, uh, how we are um, solve these issues and also how we can find an, uh, support from bacteria and from the uh, different um, microorganisms that support our activities to reduce those pollutions. Also, important case for us is not only to uh, use the offshore eff effectively, but also to reduce uh, the volumes that we need to produce by oceans. The ways how we deal with our waste, how we deal with the uh, product components that is necessary for our uh, food, but at the same time avoiding to get them from the seas. And also in our cluster, we very actively work with the wastewater, so we see that it's one of the key pollutants of our seas. And uh, looking for several approaches, sometimes not the most effective for today, but as we see, the economy changes very quickly. The two years ago, we didn't discuss a lot about the 
alternative energy issues. Now we clearly understand that without them we are not able to survive in the new economies. We also, I would like to point out some uh, startups that's already operating, uh, just to show that uh, focuses are different. Like the Happy Fish, uh, I think that the name called very, the way how they call this company is very good. Uh, what they are focusing? They are focusing on the um, product that helps uh, to lead with the fats, like for example in the mm, sorry in the savage pipes uh, to reduce the pollution that goes to the wastewater treatment or the, uh, the waste that needs to be collected and uh, further restored. It's active absorbent and also they can be used for the industry cleaning and uh, the points that I would like to point uh, to focus it's also on the, if we talk about the wind energy, when you need to wash your turbines, it's also the reagent that uh, not stays in the environment, it's biodegradable so it helps to reduce the pollution uh, on the environment and also to help us to keep our environment more safe. Um, another way, it's like dealing with the waste, with bio waste, uh, focusing on the insect growing. Um, there is very short uh, way how to lead. The, the, the problem is bio waste. Bio waste that is not containing the animals, uh, stuck, it's like the meat or the milk products, it's uh, based only on the vegetables or on fruits and all this residue is very well used by the insects and uh, growing the insects and getting from them the powder, get, getting the also uh, um, lipids and orga organic fertilizer can solve quite a critical uh, waste treatment part and also solves the issue how we create the good food for the fish, good food for the animals. It's very intensive in the proteins and uh, the projects like that one is supported by Cluster. We are leading the innovation projects for them. We are supporting them and attracting the grants to give them opportunity to make their businesses quicker and to be in the right time in the market. One more initiative that I would like to tell you today, it's all about the green of Shortech, it's the Horizon funded project. Um, and today I think that it's very important, especially I know that there is representatives from Norway, Iceland, uh, Poland. There are countries that are partners in this project, so this project is addressed already to entrepreneurs working in those countries, also in Latvia. And uh, we are focusing on the innovation uh, support. We are not giving only the money, but I think that the main value of this project is to give an uh, advisory, to make, give you the contacts, to support you uh, with the coaching, to find the right uh, partners for you, to get you into the value chain, that is, I think, it's more important than the money that could be bring by some projects. There is uh, overall two calls planned. One of them is already opened till 6 July. So you are very welcome to distribute this information to companies that you know that could be suitable for this call. And also um, there is, will be second call in the next year. However, we would like to see as much as possible call, uh, participants already in this year. We are open for consultations. Uh, we will organize additional uh, discussion to give the more information to the entrepreneurs that, so they will be able to fill the application uh, documentations and so on. And, oh, something lost. <laughs> Here is the greenoffshortech.com. You are welcome to find more information and distribute to your companies that is uh, fitting to these requirements. Thank you. paper of the, the, the role of science in developing projects, in this case in the valorization of the waste, 
and uh, using it to, to produce value, and also uh, for the event of the, the information for the, the, um, the high tech and the opportunities for SMEs and for startups to implement and develop their projects. And without further ado, I introduce the next speaker, Paul Hillen, CEO at Open Sea Farming from Norway, that I think will continue uh, the topic uh, that Christian presented, uh, talking about the sustainable seafood production offshore in Norway, and not only in Norway. The floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and thanks, special thanks to Innovation Norway for letting us to present our business case here. Um, Open Ocean Farming, which is the, uh, the name of the company, uh, is, I think you need to wind back a couple of slides, <clears> then <throat> start from the start. Um, we're a startup uh, fish farming and technology uh, development company, uh, focusing in particular on, uh, on uh, farming in exposed areas and uh, open ocean. Um, now it was supposed to come, uh, why open ocean? Uh, but I think uh, Christian from NC uh, uh, Aquatech Cluster uh, made that case more elegantly and more factual than uh, what I am planning to do. Um, you still need to wind back a couple of slides. Or did I only send uh, <laughs> half the package? Uh, Say again? The slides are in deep ocean. In deep ocean, yes. Okay, uh, let, me, uh, let me then uh, focus on this slide, which is, uh, which is the, uh, the technology that uh, we now have been developing over four years. We started out uh, together with our partner in Portugal, Geronimo Martins, uh, which is the uh, biggest food retailer in Portugal. Uh, we carried out a pilot test, uh, 20 kilometers offshore Aveiro, uh, in the midst of the Atlantic Ocean. We built and uh, installed a, uh, a uh, pilot uh, salmon farming system. We brought uh, salmon from uh, Norway, 3,000 kilometers. We built a small uh, RAS facility together with the University of Aveiro. Um, Unfortunately, and as is the case uh, with many of these uh, first, uh, te technically, technical challenges occur, and uh, due to some uh, rather banal technical problems, uh, but lack of uh, vessel infrastructure in terms of uh, heavy lift vessels, we were unable to uh, repair in time for storms. So having done that two times, we decided with our partner that we would bring the rest of the uh, development project back to Norway. And that is what we have been doing now the last couple of years, is to, uh, to develop a commercial version of our submerged farm system. And uh, now we can get to the slide that you started with, because I... <laughs> Yeah, it's not working. Well, um, so what we, uh, our concept is based on, uh, on individual cages, which are single moored to the sea bottom and uh, which are winched down to uh, a depth that is, uh, that is optimal uh, in terms of temperature and the growth conditions uh, for, the, for the fish. Uh, also avoiding the uh, the motions from the from the ocean, the cages are individually connected to a feed platform via umbilicals, and the umbilical provide the feeds uh, power and uh, and uh, control signals to uh, to each of the cages. Uh, the uh, in the return flow uh, back to the feed platform is uh, is NC large, uh, which comes from the dead fish. So there is a dead fish uh, grinder in in each of the cages. Um, 
The platform and the umbilical uh, are based on uh, well-known oil and gas technology. So, so the, the new technology here is actually the cage. And uh, it's rather challenging to talk about the cage without the picture. <laughs> Uh, at least, at, at least for you. <laughs> but yeah, let me. Uh, you can imagine <laughs> a uh, a cage structure consisting of a uh, a top structure, a center column, and the bottom structure, uh, and the net goes all around this. Uh, the, uh, the bottom structure contains a grinder, winches, okay, here we start. <laughs> okay, um, here's the... Uh, okay, Paul, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so this was why, uh, why uh, Open Ocean. I, just the chart to the right, uh, we have uh, to show the potential for farming of salmonids, which is trout and, and, and salmon. Uh, here's the, uh, the temperature in the oceans at minus 70 meters. And there are uh, tremendous opportunities uh, actually around the globe uh, for f this kind of farming, if you provided you are able to bring the fish down to the right uh, temperature level. Yeah, just some pictures from the, uh, the project in, in Portugal. Uh, bottom right, you see the cage on its way down. And uh, this is the concept I was talking about. Individual cages uh, connected to a central feed platform via umbilicals. Uh, platform and, and umbilicals, uh, well-known oil and gas technology. And, uh, and uh, our project has been the cage. Yeah, and this is the cage. Uh, as I said, it has a top structure, uh, a bottom structure, and a center column, all made out of uh, composites. And the, uh, when you harvest the fish, you bring the cage up to minus 10 meter. The harvesting vessel picks up the, uh, the harvesting hose, and you uh, winch the, uh, the top structure down to the bottom structure, and, uh, and, uh, and thereby uh, perform the, uh, the harvesting. Uh, the system can uh, operate up to 15 meter significant wave heights, uh, and the harvesting can be performed up to three meter, uh, three, uh, yeah, three meter significant wave heights. Um, the capital cost of this, uh, of a system consisting of uh, 12 cages, uh, billicles, and a feed platform, uh, producing 4,000 tons of, uh, of salmon, is about seven euro per kilo. And to comparison with uh, with the land-based uh, salmon farm, uh, you are in the order of 25 euro per kilo. So it's a rather cost-effective way of, of producing salmon. So where are we? Uh, for four years, we have spent some 4 million euros in, uh, in uh, coming to where we are today. Uh, we have now performed... Uh, uh, two rounds of model tests. We have done the hydrodynamic analysis, structural uh, analysis, and detail engineering, and we are soon rolling out a funding process for um, for uh, building a full-scale uh, prototype and testing it uh, first in the sea without fish, and then uh, with fish uh, through a growl test. Planned for startup August this year and uh, run through uh, half uh, or, or late uh, 2023. Um, this will be followed by a pre-commercial production in, uh, in Portugal. We have an agreement with our partner in Portugal. We have a test license uh, together with our partner to, uh, to, uh, to build a system uh, in the order of uh, 2,000 tons of, of production. If successful again, then it will grow into a, a full-scale commercial uh, entity. And, uh, and uh, Norway is in the process of rolling out, or, or the government is preparing for, uh, for uh, uh, allowing offshore, uh, offshore, uh, offshore uh, farming. And we expect that that process and the, the first possible license round for offshore farming in Norway 
will uh, come uh, around the uh, end of 2023, early 2024. In addition to Norway and Portugal, we, uh, we're working with opportunities in France uh, and in uh, Croatia. Croatia already has, uh, has acreage uh, reserved for, for fish farming in its uh, uh, westernmost waters. Uh, very interesting for trout farming. So that's where we are. Thank you very much. And sorry for the uh, confusion. Yeah. Yes, you have the opportunity to Everyone learned the lesson. And thank you so much. I come from Portugal. I know this project very well. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an example of how uh, the structure of a cage and uh, an offshore can bring some challenges for blue economy to develop projects. And now, without further ado, since I like to talk too much, uh, we, I introduce you, not one speaker, but our, our next speakers. I will have only the name of uh, Torvaldur Arnason and Runar that will join also, will present, they come from Iceland, and they will present also another way to, produ to produce salmon you come to, uh, to introduce your company. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, let's raise it like this. We're tall Vikings, so. <laughs> pointed at our heads. Um, good afternoon and uh, thank you for uh, hosting this. Uh, we are from Iceland and uh, we are uh, uh, as representatives of Land Eldi, uh, a salmon company uh, with grand ambitions. We are um, uh, located in the South Iceland and uh, we are producing um, or building a a land-based salmon farm where we will produce uh, 33.5 thousand tons per year up to 40,000 depending on, on uh, uh, how the environment will reveal itself. But uh, where is the, uh, the button? There it is. We're going to begin with a short of video. Let's see. To summarize things. Take a moment and imagine the future of our planet. Cool, healthy oceans sustaining a new noble species. A future dominated by a lush and plentiful nature of abundance that we protect and care for. Where we take only what we need and give back more than we take. We have arrived at a crossroads. Mankind has become a major force of nature. Our actions impact the Earth. Overreach into natural habitats disrupts the equilibrium of life. The path we take must sustainably feed future generations and also give our planet time to heal. To meet that challenge, our team of dynamic entrepreneurs and experienced specialists has developed the Deep Atlantic Salmon Project. Our mission is to inspire the global transition to fully sustainable food production. Use terraforming aquaculture to rear an abundance of superior quality salmon on land, fertilize the earth and regenerate the climate. Construction of our facility is already underway. Its stunning location may look serene, but eons ago, a violent clash of molten lava and raging oceans created a subterranean wonder that today offers the Deep Atlantic Project an amazing opportunity. A major underground river runs through compressed caverns directly underneath our facilities and supplies our Deep Atlantic Project smolts and eggs with highly oxygenated freshwater. Even deeper down, another gift is granted. The cool North Atlantic is filtered through the porous lava bed into a pristine subterranean sea. Geothermal activity maintains a constant water temperature and creates ideal conditions for ecological aquaculture. Clean, fresh, unique. 
Energy security is crucial to successful aquaculture on land. We secure the well-being of our salmon by taking advantage of Iceland's incredibly robust energy infrastructure. Abundant supply, consistent delivery and price stability are guaranteed. The Deep Atlantic project treats waste as a precious resource and recycles it into a natural fertilizer, giving the local landscape a catalyst in the form of nitrogen. It reclaims soil lost to erosion and creates flourishing woodlands. Our facilities consist of several biomes completely separated from one another. Each biome has its own seawater pipeline and dedicated biomonitoring station that fulfills our highest demands in animal welfare policy. Based on a modular approach, the biomes have allowed us to start right away. Our hatchery already sustains over a million smolts ready to migrate into the first biome. No waiting. Let's do this now. Join us and be a part of a revolution already in motion. Belong to a future where a sustainable source of salmon feeds our people, rejuvenates the land, and regenerates the oceans. Let us create this reality now. many times before, um, we all know that the, uh, the global population is increasing. Um, I mean, it's uh, the equivalent of the total population of the United States as of the global population every 40 years, meaning that in 70 years or so, it's going to be 11 billion of us. That's a lot. It is. And then single mass dictates that with more people, you need more food. And with increased food production, you get waste. And we have to think about what are we going to do with this waste. Uh, we can continue to just dump it into the ocean, but in s at some point, we're going to damage the ocean's ecosystem. And that's probably the last thing we need with, with global warming and climate change on our back already. So we're forced to innovate. Uh, innovation is cool. I know. I have a I have a specially made air washer in my lab, uh, which was um, some innovators in an orthopedic company in Iceland invented it so that I could travel and walk and attend conferences like this and meet all these wonderful people with a torn Achilles tendon. That's innovation. It's nice. <coughs> yes, but how are we... How are we going to innovate? Um, we, as the, uh, we mentioned in the video, we, uh, we pump the water from the ground, which sifts it through the, th through the, uh, the lava, old porous lava, eliminating any light, viruses, and uh, ensures us a steady supply of even temperature seawater the year round. So that's great. We have, an, uh, we have innovated a lot with, uh, on land with uh, oxygenating the water in si uh, before it enters the tank, and uh, the recycling mechanism ensures uh, uh, that we only use uh, like tw uh, around 20% of the energy, and we use 100% of the oxygen. But the waste, that's really the gold, especially for Iceland, because uh, Iceland is is, is really barren. It has the largest desert in Europe, and it's our duty to to re, uh, uh, regrow the soil, to strengthen the soil and regrow the foliage in Iceland, and preferably uh, export uh, the knowledge and and cap capability to do that. Um, we are going to uh, we have dedicated ourselves to collecting the sludge uh, and using iterative uh, design, uh, collecting uh, the, the material to as large a degree as is humanly possible using uh, drum testers and dewatering solutions and, and pressing uh, and pre presses that dry the material, warm it up and then either produce fertilizer which uh, nourishes the plant 
or biochar that nourishes the soil. I said or, I mean both. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, already a fantastic uh, cooperation with, with Nordic com uh, Norwegian companies actually, Nordic Green Plants and, and uh, uh, Blue Ocean Technology, um, who are uh, co-designing this with us. And, um, and we are looking for further, uh, further cooperation and innovation because we look at ourselves as an innovation company um, not only, you know, only an aquaculture company, of course, is first and foremost, but this is what we believe will set um, our product, the pr pristine, the su uh, superior quality salmon that we're already, we already put it into the first la uh, large tech, the first generation. That was it, two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and we're, we're really proud of it, and it looks absolutely marvelous. Uh, but, uh, and this is a, but this is a marathon. It's a marathon, it's a long run. So, what's the future like? Future's bright. Um, it, when, uh, when we achieve what we are setting out to do, we, we do believe that we have a chance to, to con contribute to the recirculation of nutrients in the ecosystem. And that's cool. It has to be. Yeah, we, uh, we uh, think of it, we, we, uh, we think of uh, salmon producing as a holistic uh, journey. We think of it holistically. So uh, we take the sludge, uh, we uh, mix it with, with manure from the farms around and uh, grow the, uh, improve the soil, grow the plants, feed the livestock, which then again uh, supplies manure to, to the next batch of, of fertilizers. And, um, and also uh, cut off uh, dead fish. All this is comp it's a holistic approach. We use everything. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's uh, working on this is often, you often get lost in numbers and methodolo methodology and, and, and uh, graphs and, and great uh, cooperations. But I, I would implore everyone to, to keep thinking about why we're doing this. We're protecting the, the nature, preserving it, renewing it for future generations. And that's uh, the people we want to work with. So, so thank you. Uh, just to sum up, we are changing the gameplay of sustainable aquaculture. We will, and you should join us. Yes. Thank you. What are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> innovative, innovative, uh, additional uh, uh, cooperators. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I think Paul can give you good advice He's also on this subject. And also our next speaker, Ingrid Marstad from Norway, that I think can give uh, uh, good advices of how to get accelerator. Um, welcome. Ingrid comes from Norway and will present us uh, the, the Catapult Ocean activities, right? The floor is yours. Thank you. It's been a long day. I hope you can stand for a few more minutes here. Uh, yes, I'm Ingrid from Catapult Ocean, uh, based in Oslo, Norway, but we invest in companies globally. Oh, this is not working. Is that working? No. <laughs> there. Okay, who we are. We invest in startups with a positive impact on the ocean in some kind of way. So we invest in startups from all over the world within a broad spectrum uh, within the ocean, uh, harvesting, ocean health, energy, transportation, and uh, new frontiers. So in uh, harvesting, it's both seaweed and uh, aquaculture um, uh, and fish. Uh, ocean health, uh, we have some companies within uh, microplastics and plastics from the ocean. Um, ocean wind is very relevant now and uh, floating sun. Uh, yeah, a lot of different things. 
this is why we invest in startups. Uh, we see that we need to change uh, in the, we need to see the change in the world. We need to uh, change the way we're uh, acting and we're seeking the new solutions. Uh, we see companies that can be profitable uh, because we want them to grow and scale. So we invest in the companies that we see can grow uh, and scale globally because um, that's where we see we can have the most impact. Uh, trying to uh, catalyze capital, um, talent and companies towards impact. So, uh, and we also inspire investors. So we're not only thinking about what we can do in Catapult Ocean within the companies, but we're also trying to uh, convince other investors that this is a good way to, this is good to put your money in the impact companies uh, because both you have a good uh, profit, but also you have impact with your money. So it's not only, uh, you wouldn't, or at least I wouldn't put my money into oil business now. Uh, you need to look uh, forward. And also, uh, yeah, we want uh, ocean and climate impact to maximize their positive impact. So we're working a lot with that. And it's possible. We've just seen uh, in the beginning of March, uh, we had actually two uh, unicorns in our portfolio. Uh, this is the Catapult Accelerator portfolio. We have been investing both uh, uh, impact, uh, general impact companies, social impact companies, and also climate companies, uh, and ocean. And two of our, of our uh, social impact companies, uh, they were unicorns in, in March. Uh, and that means that they're valued uh, 1 billion US dollars. And that's, they were in the accelerator program uh, two and a half years ago. So it's really, really impressive. And actually a few, uh, it's not many years ago, this is our owner, Taral uh, Nusa, who started, uh, founded uh, Catapult Ocean uh, and Catapult. Uh, and people are actually almost laughing of him uh, a few years ago. So it changed, the world is changing really. Uh, but why ocean investment? Investments. Uh, we see that we see really big growth in uh, ocean wind, especially. We need more clean energy in the world. Uh, so um, to to use the ocean for uh, for energy um, production as well. Um, global uh, transportation. The sea is most. Uh, I think 80 or 90 percent of the all transportation in the world is done by the sea, and uh, it's. But it's also important to take uh, good care of the ocean because it's, uh, the ocean is producing the oxygen or more than uh, between 50 and 80 percent of the ox oxygen in the world. Uh, in the ocean portfolio, we have both ocean and climate portfolio, but in, uh, in the ocean we have uh, 42 investments from all over the world um, in the different uh, sectors that I uh, told you. Um, mostly in Europe and uh, America uh, for now, but also some uh, companies in Asia and Africa. Um, yeah, we have, if you put them into buckets like this, we have transport energy and harvesting, uh, where we seek to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have health, ocean health companies, uh, where we want to uh, uh, cater there or take care of the land waste reduction. We see a lot of ocean plastics goes from the rivers into the ocean, so it's it's important to stop it before it gets into the ocean. And uh, for example, for tuna cools, they're um, they're making uh, uh, coolers from uh, coconut waste. So that's uh, they're solving two problems at the same time. Instead of uh, farmers in the Philippines are burning the coconut waste creating CO2 emissions, they're actually taking, they're buying that from the farmers and, and creating coconut coolers out of that and selling that to fishermen so that they won't have to use the styrofoam uh, coolers. So that's one of the uh, yeah, micro solutions uh, that we have, but we want to scale it larger. And also uh, frontier technologies, uh, we see that we don't know enough in, uh, about the ocean. It's a lot of things that we don't know yet, uh, so we're, uh, we're using, uh, we need more um, information about what's happening underneath the sea. Um, Atlan Space is using um, uh, technology to, to um, avoid uh, overfishing, um, and Paradents are actually using tourists as uh, helpers for researchers to, to find out, okay, what's the temperature in the ocean, what's uh, 
pH level. They just they collect the data within with the di uh, diving cameras and then uh, sharing that with researchers. And some more uh, companies that I like here. Oceanium uh, is using seaweed um, to produce uh, bioplastics uh, and also um, in uh, in food uh, feed production for cattle. Uh, Ocean Rainforest uh, is a company from the Faroe Islands. Uh, they're also producing a lot of seaweed, uh, also expanding to the US now. Uh, they're also uh, we're still um, they're still uh, re doing research on cattle feed and how much um, because it's, it seems like uh, when you're feeding uh, cattle um, seaweed, then you, you reduce uh, the burping from the cows. So it will actually reduce the methane uh, um, from the cows. So that's a good thing. We still don't know enough yet, and that's uh, maybe a common thing with all the companies that we have invested in. They're still early, it's still seed phase. So it's, uh, it's early companies, and we still uh, we have to invest and then do research at the same time so, uh, to, to secure. Uh, if we had the research here, uh, then it would be probably too late for, for the investments for us. So we, we take big risks there. Uh, Alging is an Israeli and German company using algae to uh, dye uh, clothing, because we see that's a big uh, source of um, uh, yeah, um, environmental uh, issues in the ocean from uh, dyeing of the clothes. Uh, Arc Marine, I think that's a cool company as well. They're using bio, um, cement uh, in uh, in the ocean they they create artificial reefs uh, that's really relevant now with the uh, ocean wind industry where they need to um, fasten the pipes to the to the ground or seabed uh, so that if they can use uh, artificial reefs or whether um, whether life underwater can live uh, we you they secure the biodiversity but also uh, solve the problem for the ocean wind industry and uh, Pinovo is another um, company. They are um, they using a closed loop system to when they uh, fix uh, bridges and they need to take off the paint with sandblasting. And they instead of previously it's been open system so that you have the sand and uh, paint is going into the ocean and that is microplastics. So uh, when they have the closed closed loop system, they can uh, they take up the microplastics and the sand and can clean it. So they avoid uh, microplastics in the ocean. And they also, uh, that's a better solution both for the workers, because it's less dust, and it's a better solution for the ocean, and it's uh, faster and uh, yeah, better for the environment. So it's just a win-win solution. And this Hollinator, it's a Dutch company we have invested in. They're using uh, sunshine and seawater to produce uh, desalinating water. Uh, and they're not using... Um, uh, they're not using um, uh, pesticides or uh, much um, chemicals in, in this process. Uh, and also the brine that they, uh, they let out is less salty and it has a higher temperature. It's not that, no, it's lower temperature, so it's not that warm. Because the problem now with the, some desalination processes is that you let out the brine, very salty water in the, in the ocean, and also it's quite high temperature, it's usually 85 degrees. Uh, and when you let that out in the ocean, we don't know actually what's happening there. Yes, we have a three-month accelerator program where we work with the startups uh, to accelerate them. Um, this is the main topics that we do uh, focus on. Uh, impact is really important. Uh, investor readiness, we see that we need to connect them with investors to be able to scale, and that's where most of these companies lack uh, competence. And we connect them to a big network that we have. So a lot of the clusters that have been here today, it's really important, though it's very valuable for us to be in contact with clusters because we uh, get a lot of uh, companies from the clusters and we can also send our companies after the Accelerator program back to the clusters to be part of the network. We see that's really important. So if you have a uh, startup that wants to apply for funding and Accelerator program, uh, they can apply here. Uh, you can use your phones for this one. I'll keep it up for a few seconds. Or you can find it in uh, catapultocean.com as well. Um, 
And we do have a report that we write every year just to, to, just to show the ocean impact space. Uh, we do a report uh, based on our pipeline. We have more than 2,000 companies in our pipeline. So we do um, just look at it. Okay, what do we see in the ocean? Where, what, what are the trends? What, do we, uh, what companies are coming up? Where is, which areas are growing? And uh, where do the investments go? So we've looked at that in this report. And that's my last slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. some topics. Okay, now with the micro on. Laura Elkagova, please, if you can join. Maza Safunzi Kukuk. Flaviana Rotaru, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And then I'll let you go. My first question will be for you. And I don't know if the you can join us too. Okay, no worries. Yes, you can join me, please. I will stay here you because I have to leave the list. <laughs> okay. Fanny Tsiron, sorry. Representing Madali. And I can sit here next to you. Yes, yeah, sure. And so, thank you so much for your presentations. I think that the audience has lots of questions for you. So, I will try to represent them. And my first question is for Flaviana uh, to talk about clusters for sure, to tell us, complete your presentation and talk about the role of clusters at regional, but also the interaction with other clusters at the European level and how your solutions are contributing for the bioeconomy in Europe, please. So, I think, uh, thank you very much for your question. I think the cluster's role is very simple, is catalyzer for everything that comes as an idea from startup, but also for, uh, from public research. Their role is to match make the need with the market. So, actually, clusters are, smart, are, are markets at your very, very close to you, so use them as markets to promote ideas, technologies, know-how. But if you are a startup, use them in order to get the knowledge for free from your other cluster members. This is our role. For connecting at EU level, it's at regional, it's easy. At national, it's easy. At EU level, usually, they are much more narrow, the domains. You have, like for example, biotech. You don't have health as a such. You have pharma, meta clusters. But even so, you can, you can find your way to get free information, to get uh, free knowledge and counseling. A lot of free knowledge is crossing these clusters. Thank you. Okay. Sam, uh, thank you so much. I don't know if uh, the other colleagues want to add something to the clusters topic. Actually, I don't have any positive um, <laughs> uh, experiences, thanks, with the clusters. In the ones that I had contact with were quite bureaucratic and uh, nobody took um, a leading role. Mm -hmm. so, so this is important. It's if somebody in the cluster has a, a facilitator, maybe better to say, role to, to help, to start the conversation. Later on, when we all get to know each other, the conversation will be easier. But at the start, I think it's a little bit difficult. That's why like I in conferences. It, to use uh, certified clusters, mm -hmm. because you know exactly this kind of excitement, it's measured mm -hmm. by the European Secretary for uh, Cluster Analysis. Is this cluster moving? It has a certain label. It's not moving, it doesn't get the label. So it's okay not to be labeled, but in the meantime, the quality of the work can be discussable. Any cluster should have also catalyzer. This is why this cluster exists. So this is, a, let's say, eligibility criteria. If they are not responding on time, move forward. And also, in this platform I promoted, you can go directly to the member. You don't need an intermediary. So be very careful that each cluster is forced to put there also all the members. So you can contact directly the members. 
You don't need an intermediator. Thank you. And about the cooperation with other clusters, uh, as I was saying, from other countries and at European level, how do you see this uh, landscape? Well, it's already happening for certain years. We had last a program called COSME, which is financing exactly this uh, exchange of knowledge between cluster and the cluster working together. So we have also a financial instrument, European financial instrument that covers this. We already have, as Rohel health, this experience. We organize like economic mission, international economic mission in USA, Japan, Korea. So it's nothing new. That depends also very much of, you know, what you want to do with the cluster. Okay. Thank you. And since we are talking about clusters more dedicated to health, we continue with Laura now. And of course, if you uh, allow me, I will oh, have to go okay. because I will lose the place. Just, <laughs> I'm sorry, this delay affected my schedule, but I'm really glad to meet you and thank you for your attendance okay. at this hour. I have to run, it's very so, yeah, late. Thank you so much. Yeah. And if I lose okay. the plane, I come back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I think we have a conversation to finish from your presentation. Since we, when we talk about bio-based solutions for the pharma sector, we have a, a difficult process. We, uh, the, the startups or company or, or, or uh, small enterprises that want to develop their business around, for example, bio-based products uh, for, for medicine, for biomaterials. And you talk about the sourcing, you talk about the development of the process. That is of one of the, the, the challenges for, for example, for startups that has to bring the product to market. And then, of course, the investment uh, to, uh, to, to, to the market, to arrive to the market. And Laura, what can be done uh, sorry, Laura, but, no, okay. sorry. <laughs> but I understood the question. No, it's okay. Uh, well, uh, it, it's not. You, you need to find the partner for a, maybe a part of the product, and maybe to think if you are developing a molecule, to think about being a producer of an ingredient, not uh, the final product itself. Uh, but if you are talking about uh, the product, um, the, I think the most important thing is to, to approach the right company. Because a lot of time, um, companies that uh, develop products that are not in our um, focus of development approach us and then <laughs> get rejected. Because if we are, for example, uh, our um, expertise is uh, in uh, nasal hygiene in, uh, um, or uh, in um, ophthalmic products and nasal products. So if a company develops uh, heart medicine or something like that, uh, we, we are not the right, um, the right producer to talk to. Uh, this is one thing. The, the second thing is um, your, your documentation needs to, to, to have enough quality to show that you really know your, your product, and but also to be prepared to listen to the company, which are their question, um, because it's not easy to go and invest a lot of money into clinical studies with the, the possibility that the product won't come to the market. So, um, the, the main issue is time. It won't be a project, one project of three years. It will be multiple projects. So maybe you need to find that most expensive part of the development and then uh, to, to finance that with some grant or something like that. But first of all, be aware of how lengthy the process is. Uh, be very clear what do you want to do, product or ingredient, and then find company that's in line with that uh, product of yours. Okay, thank you. And Maza, just to wrap up, mm -hmm. in J, uh, JGL, mm -hmm. you are looking also, you presented the case of the seawater. Mm -hmm. You are looking 
at uh, marine bioresources or marine bioresources uh, uh, based products to use uh, uh, for fine compounds with uh, particular bioactivities? Uh, yes, uh, we do. Uh, our Expertise is ophthalmology, uh, nasal medicine, uh, hygiene of the nasal, the congestants, and uh, any product that could go into that kind of uh, solution would be something that we are interested. Also, we are producer of sterile solutions, so it it has to be something water soluble because if it, the, if the comp compound is made for tablets. Uh, we don't have the technology to, to develop tablets. So it is interesting and we are looking into it. We have a project that uh, is searching for, for a compound uh, similar like that. And uh, I can tell you it's uh, not easy uh, with this new medical device regulation. A lot of uh, clinical proof that we need to produce it's, it's much bigger now than uh, when we started the, the project uh, two years ago with the uh, medical device uh, d directive. Uh, a last question, but it's not only for you. You can also uh, answer, please, that is for the startup of, of someone that is uh, trying, has an idea and try to, to develop, how they convince an investor with this uh, so long process to bring a product to the market that they have uh, that uh, pharmaceuticals is a good segment, a good way to go. Huh. <laughs> Not an easy uh, way. Uh, well, uh, for example, JGL, we know our business. So if you present uh, your idea, we will also look into it and see whether this has potential. It's not, uh, it's not that you need to, to uh, convince, convince us that this is a good business opportunity, but it's better to try to convince us that you know what you are doing, that you know your product, and that you uh, can help us to, to solve that uh, scientific questions that could arise uh, from the development, uh, etc. And that business part, as a business company, we can do it uh, ourselves. This is from our perspective. Thank you so much. Now, Laura, <laughs> uh, I think you can add some, some information on this topic since you are operating more uh, on e e artificial intelligence and some kind of the when we talk about the digital twin, mm -hmm. we are talking about high tech technology, and this is easy for a for a startup or for a PME to to uh, to get some some funding. Uh, in this specific case, you are operating in the Baltic Sea, but it is how do you see the the picture? It is scalable. Uh, of course, it's uh, scalable. Um, such digital projects uh, where AI is involved, uh, the, the main aim is to, uh, to scale it uh, if we succeed, because uh, otherwise uh, it, it of course will do for, for good for some area, but um, as for any, if, if we call this uh, a startup project, uh, for every startup, uh, the goal is to to scale the the pro the, the pro, uh, product the uh, the uh, the solution. So it's uh, naturally, yeah. Um, I can add to the previous question regarding the uh, uh, the uh, pharma startups. Um, I'm not an expert in in this, but. Uh, as you mentioned, the um, usually uh, such uh, such startups attract investors from the professionals. For example, uh, in Latvia, we have um, a company Roche, uh, which develops uh, pro produces many uh, many products, and within Roche there is an incubator for startups. So they uh, they they support startups to develop their their ideas, and they, as professionals, also invest in those startups. So there are some fields when not uh, uh, 
um, all investors uh, do know the, the specifics in the specific field and um, yeah, and um, it's not it's it's not for every investor uh, to to know where there is biz there is or is not business and uh, yeah it, it takes some some knowledge and some expertise in some cases. Yes, it's not just one stop, yeah. course, <laughs> and you get all the answers. Yeah. Now uh, about the the mission C twenty thirty. Mm -hmm. So how blue economy is considered central in the to policy makers and to political leaders, are they, how, how far did you go with your mission C2030 and how these other entities are looking at the project? Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the politicians, we, uh, we have uh, onboarded our uh, prime minister, so quite far uh, within Latvian borders, uh, but um, of course, there is this uh, big uh, job to do to uh, onboard the whole society, and this is our next step. So, if among uh, politicians and industry uh, there uh, there is an awareness of this mission, so right now uh, we have to do a great job to onboard uh, the whole society. This is uh, one of the next steps uh, because there is. There usually are those questions, uh, what's in there for me? Why, like why we have to do this? And this is all, uh, this is a story uh, all about priorities. What do we put forward and what are, is our priority number one, number two? Okay, thank you so much. And now, Fanny. Uh, and also, I forgot to invite uh, Evisia. She, she's not here, she left also, okay. Uh, to talk about the since you you were the one presenting a great uh, a great all all of them were great but these uh, innovative solutions they are using not only waste but are using co-products and byproducts uh, and want to turn them in valuable products and so in this case is Europe uh, uh, accepting or when I, I talk all the players mm -hmm. accepting this idea of have uh, proteins and other components from waste from byproducts from co-products for food for feed mm -hmm. is is this the way to go actually the, the most uh, important part of this project the sumac project is that uh, it's a ma very mature idea because uh, re because recently uh, the consumers or all the stakeholders, including the industry and the retail market, are very close to selecting more sustainable products, including healthier products, food products, uh, environmental friendly products, uh, while at the same time using not only raw materials, con conventional raw materials, but also bioproducts. And uh, considering that uh, during the past decades we have an in continuously increasing uh, production in the aquaculture sector and going uh, towards a more convenient food product, which is uh, mainly processed fish and fisher products, this produces a huge amount of waste. So uh, the consumers and all the stakeholders are currently very uh, keen to investing in more sustainable food production methods, considering the replacement of uh, chemical preservatives with natural, natural products, and uh, investigating uh, alternative proteins using uh, sustainable uh, resources. I had the percentage that 30, 35% of the waste is from fish and marine products. Yes, uh, it's actually more or less 35% of the uh, food that is produced for human consumption that is discarded. And the same uh, percentage uh, accounts for fish and fish and uh, seafood products. And you also should keep in mind that 50% uh, uh, of the discarded food are of of, in, of good quality, it could have been consumed. 
So this is something that we also need to consider while evaluating the food waste uh, aspect. Thank you so much. So I have a question about uh, algae. Since we do not have anyone from algae, I will put it in a global uh, way. And what are the market trends or the way to go in the market, the, 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 uh, the segments the, for the blue economy development, in your opinion? You can start. <laughs> you will defend. <laughs> you have the micro, you can start. Um. There are two approaches. We have the algae, the macro algae, and the micro yes. algae production. Uh, as far as I know, the, the, the micro algae uh, research has started uh, for the uh, biogas and biodiesel uh, production. Uh, recently, it seems that it might be a, a good idea to produce alternative proteins and alternative uh, food and feed additives. The challenge is to uh, limit the production cost so as to have a more sustainable production method, so as these components can be actually used uh, for a final, uh, for a product that uh, might be appropriate for uh, food or feed. Uh, I guess that for a nutraceuticals and cosmetics, there is a different approach because we have a different limitation on the cost of the production. So, nutraceuticals uh, is one. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not expert in algae either. Uh, the, the ones that I came into contact were brown algae uh, for, and the use uh, <clears throat> The use that we thought that we will go for would be treatment of acne because there is some research, research, research showing that uh, some uh, com co components of the brown algae uh, can help into fighting microorganisms, uh, restoring the skin and everything uh, it need, needed. Uh, the project uh, was uh, supposed to go that we find those uh, ingredients to characterize them and then to uh, extract uh, them for making a medical device uh, product. However, uh, during the, the project, uh, we found out that the cost of extraction would be so costly in, the, in that case, we were going for two specific uh, compounds and then the, the cost of the product uh, just wasn't uh, feasible. So it's that's why I said in, in the presentation in, it's one thing to produce a gram, half a gram in a laboratory but when you when you want to produce a, a global uh, project you need kilos and those kilos need to be cost-effective uh, easy to source and uh, also with a good set uh, of documentation. I'm always getting back to the documentation because it's so important. We, we quite often get approached uh, with the producers of some sort of uh, natural extract uh, or uh, essential oil or something like that. Well, I, and they all believe in their products, but for us it's not enough we need to, to prove to they need to prove to us and, and but we need to prove to health authorities that this uh, substance is controlled that uh, is uh, that the quality is good because um, even the trends are for more natural products the health authorities a little bit hesitant uh, about them because in a natural product you have hundreds of uh, components and uh, it's not easy to standardize. You, you can standardize, but it's not, it's at the bottom end, you still have hundreds and hundreds of components. And in a synthetic product, you have one. And it's easier to, to control the risks, maybe some um, negative effects and something when you have one substance instead of hundreds. So the way to go was to mimetize. You find that compound and then you yes. produce. And that was for medical device. We could go to cosmetics. For cosmetics, it's much easier. The, the threshold is lower. But uh, you need to, to 
be prepared to put a lot of money into marketing because that's what sells cosmetics. Medicines and medical devices are data, cosmetics are stories. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I don't know if in the audience uh, there is any question that you want to cover. We have someone from microalgae here. Uh, I don't know if you want to add some topic to the questions of the microalgae producing a specific compound, what to do with the, the, the rest of the biomass, for example. You can join us. <laughs> Since we are not experts in algae, <laughs> <No. laughs> please help us. Thank you. Um, what I have in common with you is that I have not. Uh... Sorry. Okay. So what I have in common with you too is that I am also not an expert in in microalgae for feet, or and for for food or feet. Uh, because uh, what we do is, is strictly just cultivate microalgae with high value compounds in mind. So uh, I am maybe, even though I work in the microalgae industry, not the, a very good person to, to answer this. But sure, there are companies uh, uh, all around the world which are using, uh, cultivating microalgae for, for food, and maybe we are going to see more of that in, in the near future. But the question about what we do with the rests is, is actually very good because my 10-minute presentation earlier was so short that I couldn't even get to that topic. So it's very good to, to be able to, to answer that question here. Um, uh, well, like I said, said in, my, in my presentation, when we have harvested our biomass, only five, between five and six percent of the biomass is astaxanthin, the product that the, we produce. The rest, 94, 95%, is, um, uh, is basically something that we could define as, as waste. It's something that, that we don't use for our, uh, for our products. Today, this is simply used as a fertilizer and, uh, and not used, uh, there's, there's nothing more done with it than that, only used as a fertilizer, which is a very like low value and maybe not the, the most clever way to, to, to use this waste. But we have two projects ongoing now, where um, in co collaboration with, with uh, research groups, we are trying to, to figure out some, some more intelligent ways of utilizing this, this, uh, this waste. And they are actually both related to um, to topics that we that we had in the presentation from uh, from uh, from Norway, from what was the name of again of the the company? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, and uh, one of the ways is to to use uh, our like biological um, dry um, algae waste to produce um, biodegradable plastics. And that's, that's a project that, that has all, already shown some, some nice potential. The only, like, um, the only big question there is if we are going to be able to produce this in a cost-effective manner so it can really replace plastic to some extent. That's the one question. And then another uh, project we're working on in, in collaboration with, uh, with an Icelandic institute is to use uh, our biological uh, algae waste to uh, to feed uh, cattle with the aim of reducing their their methane emissions so that's what we are doing with our our waste and, and, and two uh, interesting projects at this time thank you so much eric we need we needed some input about since part of the topic it's algae production we needed some something to to cover this topic thank you so much <laughs> And now, to the audience, if you have any questions, please, go ahead. It's just a follow-up to, to what you were saying. Uh, I was wondering, because this is a huge component area, I can tell you what it's, what it's for. If you use it to, for uh, feed cattle, then that will be used in a different extraction from that. And I'm curious about algae, and it's you are talking about the product? Yeah. If we can just skip extracting and then using the using the uh, biomass itself instead, okay, 
It's a very good question. We have that in our portfolio. We, 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 sell, we also sell just like um, biomass that contains, in the form of powder, which contains 5 to 6% astaxanthin. That's something we can provide. But the reality is that most of the companies that are buying our product, our astaxanthin, they, uh, they use this for like, uh, for example, soft gels, because this is, of course, as I said, this is, um, this is uh, pharmaceuticals it's for human consumption. And then for that, it, it's much, much more convenient for them to, to have this product in the form of dissolved compound, purified compound in oil. So it, it's, it's, it's strictly due to like the, the demand of the customers. That's basically the reason why we are extracting, I would say, maybe 95% of our, our product with critical CO2 extraction instead of just providing the powder. But if, uh, if the demand for the powder powder, uh, high percent astaxanthin in, 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 uh, in uh, like uh, algae biomass gets higher, of course, it's, it's simply easier for us to provide that because then we don't have to do the, the, the extraction. But that's absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. I have to conclude the session. And uh, it was for me a pleasure to share the floor with you uh, and with the audience here and those that are at home follow, following the, this event and tell you that Blue Economy can play an important role towards meeting sustainable and, and climate change challenges and greatly contribute to economic recovery and to the growth world worldwide, delivering new knowledge and facilities to products and services using cutting edge technologies. This was what I have learned with all of you today and tell you that, uh, of course, we hope that a sustainable bio blue bioeconomy in Europe will strengthen the connection between economy, society, and environment. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.